It's got everything that I wanted in a college, the small faculty, the small student body, but then the resources of a giant university. Welcome to the Athena Film Festival and this panel on indie film financing, how to find money for your movie. Film financing is widely acknowledged as one of the most challenging aspects of the filmmaking process. This session will provide useful tips and strategies to find and to pitch to investors and to market your film for success. My name is Ariella Salampour and I'm a senior here at Barnard and an Athena scholar. On behalf of the Athena Center and Women in Hollywood, I wanna thank you all for joining us. I hope you are all enjoying the festival. We could not have produced this festival without the support of all of our sponsors. In a few minutes, you'll see the names of our honorary host committee and festival sponsors. A special thank you to each and every one of them. I want to particularly acknowledge the support of our founding sponsor, the Artemis Rising Foundation, and its CEO and founder, Regina K. Scully. A special thank you as well to the Ravenal Foundation for sponsoring this panel. I'd like to introduce to you Susan Margolin, today's moderator. With over 25 years of experience, Susan Margolin has built a reputation as a pioneer of digital distribution and a dedicated supporter of independent filmmakers. In 1991, she launched the independent film and TV distribution company, New Video Group, and in 1999, DocuRama, where she has championed more than 400 award-winning nonfiction films. Margolin recently launched St. Mark's Production, a production and distribution company. Please join me in welcoming Susan Margolin. Thank you so much. You. Is this, yeah, great. So we have a fantastic panel. Um, I was saying to Tiana, uh, that we, I could spend you know, 90 minutes with, with each of these panelists individually today and um, have really you know, scintillating conversations about film finance with the wealth of experience and, and knowledge uh, up here. So thanks to all the panelists for, for their, their time. Um, I think to start off, uh, we're, we're gonna have each of the panelists introduce themselves uh, take a couple of minutes, but before we do that, I'd love to see, uh, with a show of hands, how many people in the audience are first-time filmmakers. Great, great. So, so we have a lot of, uh, lot of folks uh, who are gonna get a lot out of this panel. Uh, we're gonna be talking about you know, many different modes of film finance from um, equity to uh, tax incentives and rebates to crowdsourcing um, and and grants and uh, you know raising money through foundations. So, without further ado, pass the baton to Tiana. Hi, um, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Tiana Idoni Matthews, and um, let's see, I've been working now in the industry for just about 10 years. Uh, I did my undergrad at Harvard. I studied VES uh, with a focus on documentary film. Quickly learned documentary film makes you no money. So <laughs> I switched over to feature filmmaking. Um, my first job was actually working with Rachel Horowitz on Grey Gardens. I was her assistant post-production. And uh, I quickly moved to producing. Uh, my first film was Maria, My Love, which premiered at Tribeca a couple of years ago. Uh, it was very interesting because it was a combination of crowdfunding as well as equity investment that I sought for the film. And um, more recently, uh, I was one of the executive producers on Hello, My Name is Doris with Sally Field. Um, that was a straight equity play. Um, actually got my master's in fine arts from Columbia. so. Uh, always have a soft spot in my heart for this festival, and happy to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Watanabe Batten, and um, this is going to sound like a re repeat. I went to Harvard and studied VES. 
many years before she did. Um, and back when we used to edit on Steenbecks and shoot with, you know, CP16s. Really? I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um, the relics, I don't know if you use those here, but um, I also uh, started filmmaking there. I, I did documentary filmmaking, but also did my first um, foray into getting money and producing a film, um, doing an, a film on Irish illegal immigrants, marrying for green cards, which seems re rather relevant today somehow, um, and got my first grant, not knowing it was difficult, with the Ford Foundation and other many others. Um, and so my most of what I produce, I quickly moved out to LA, worked for some producers that were had both been heads of studios, so had a a real high learning curve, uh, working for Paula Weinstein and Mark Rosenberg. Paula now is at Tribeca, um, but back then she, I went to seek her out because she had produced a dry white season. And I literally went and looked for everybody um, that had any alumni affiliation that I could talk to as a producer. So I would definitely recommend that to all of you. Um, I worked in LA for many years, kind of the opposite of what people do on Warner Brothers lot and was wonderful with all the movie stars, all that stuff, and then moved. Um, you know, I always did sort of big kind of brand tentpole stuff um, as well as indie films. And so I would do everything from work at propaganda, doing line producing, and then, because it was lucrative, I'd go produce a short or a low budget feature with a friend, because that's who you work with, your friends. Um, and then I moved more to New York, establishing a music video company back when that was actually profitable, and had a hip hop music video company with Nick Quested from Goldcrest Post, which some of you may know, because it's a local company, um, and produced huge music videos for um, a lot of artists you probably know, uh, Nas, P. Diddy, on and on. And, um, and then I decided I wanted to look more seriously at both being a producer and an advocate. And, um, and so I am committed to doing work that is um, kind of champions some of the people that I respect. I'm working on a feature with Julie Dash that's a documentary feature on one of our mentors, both of our mentors, um, I knew her when I was two, Julie knew her in Daughters of the Dust. I'm also working on a, a, a television series on 1850 New Orleans that's all about race mixing and quadroon balls and immigrants. And then another, um, a, a feature with another um, Harvard grad, um, Maria Aggie Carter, on her immigrant experience and being undocumented until she went to Harvard. So. I don't have, I haven't ventured very far out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> and that's, that's it. Uh, I'm gonna leave because I didn't go to Harvard. Um, <laughs> okay. It's kind of a bad okay. shame um, sometimes. Uh, I went to Vassar, uh, another good women's school. Um, though we have boys. Um, and uh, I had no desire to produce, ever. Um, I was a biopsych major. I wrote my college essays about how psychoneurobiochemistry and acting were really the same thing, no joke. And, um, and then I decided to be an actress and um, have done that for a while. Um, and in 2008, uh, I made a move. My father died very, very suddenly. It was 10 days and it was cancer. And I was shocked by people's inability to talk about grief and loss. And it was the first time where I felt the need to make a piece of art uh, about something to help, like every cell in my soul said, I need to make this art and no one else is gonna do this. Um, so I made a short, short called Speed Grieving and raised everything to do that. I went nonprofit with it. I, I went under an umbrella of women make movies, so I was a nonprofit, so it was all donation. And shockingly, most people have been hit by cancer in some way, so everybody donated everything. My food was donated. My locations were, everything was donated. Um, and everyone loved donating because they felt like they were serving art that was serving people. And um, we premiered at the Hamptons Film Festival. 
We went to a, you know, a dozen more festivals, but I worked with grief counselors and social workers to create a discussion guide that went with the short and a journal that went with the short um, and like a whole PowerPoint presentation so that it's used in um, hospitals and hospices and cancer support communities across the country to help people as sort of art therapy to process grief and loss. Did not, that was, it was really hard to do. It was really emotionally, I started in it, like it came from an idea in my head, started in it, produced it, um, helped write it, uh, did not direct it. Um, did not ever plan to produce again after that, but then you like get the urge again. Um, and helped a friend as she was producing her film. Um, and then uh, with Equity, we had an idea and um, went from script to screen in about two years, um, which is very fast. Uh, but we really wanted to have it come out before, uh, like r right before the election. It was really important because it's about, it's the first ever female driven Wall Street movie and we wanted it to be part of that conversation. One thing that I will say about making movies well, uh, let me just say, raise your hand if you have a business degree. Okay, yeah. And raise your hand if you have a marketing and PR degree. Yeah. Those two things are everything for producing. Everything. You need those tools. So if you don't have them, you will have to learn them. Um, and, um, and, a huge piece of making a small independent movie is no as having an audience and creating press and marketing and knowing that reverse engineering that and one of the reasons we pushed to make this movie was knowing that we wanted to be part of a conversation that was starting to happen um, and get it knowing we would get a lot of press and a lot of attention for that reason um, yeah so then. Um, hi, I'm Sam Tabbitt. Um, I am a creative producer and cinematographer, um, and a lot of my work focuses around criminalization of queer and trans folks of color. Um, I used to work at Chicken and Egg Pictures, which is a uh, grant organization for uh, women filmmakers, and I produced my first feature on Southwest of Salem that premiered at Tribeca last, this year and is screening tonight. Um, and that film focuses on four Latino lesbians who were wrongfully convicted of a rape crime in the mid 90s. Um, so a lot of my work has like a direct activism uh, lens as well and that film was completely uh, done by first time, first time director, uh, first time editor uh, partially and donation and grants, no equity and crowdfunding. So great. Fantastic, and everybody, um, the, the bios for our panelists are uh, online uh, with the listing for the, and I recommend everybody check them out because very, uh, you learn a lot about uh, the, the business by looking at the trajectory of, of, of great producers. Uh, again, for, with a show of hands, um, how many folks are looking to uh, get a documentary made? Okay, so good number. How about narrative? Okay, so why don't we start then um, with uh, um, Tiana, if you can talk a little bit about um, you know, your process when you decide to get involved in a, in a project, um, you know, sort of what are, the, what are the first steps that you take and you know, what are the necessary elements of the package that you put together? Sure. Um, so I could speak to it now. You know, I'll start with where I am now. I've moved more into just in mainly investing. And earlier in my career, um, I was kind of like an investor, also procuring funds, and also working as a creative producer on set. Um, so right now, as an investor, what I look at is first thing I do is I read the script. Usually, I read it at the gym. Um, <laughs> on the uh, Stairmaster. If I could still, if I miss a beat, it's because I'm really into the script. And I'm like, okay. Like, I, <laughs> all right, like this needs to be read. 
Um, and that's how it was with the last project I worked on. I literally remember when I tripped off it, and I was like, I have to invest in it. Um, and then after I read the script and I'm into the project, I actually look at you know, the crew behind it and also the cast. Um, for this particular project, it was, I believe UTA brought it to me, and they already had Sally Field on board. They already had Michael Showalter on board. So, you know, that for me added a sense of um, investment potential. Um, and I'm gonna explain that more. As an investor now, I have a hesitancy in investing in first time filmmakers. Not because anything has to do with talent or anything, it's just there is the higher risk potential because when you're looking at it from a purely a pure investment perspective, there is the element of you have to think of the exit of the film. And having certain talent uh, attached to a project ensures a higher percentage of a positive exit, um, whether it be VOD, theatrical. So that's something to really consider when you're speaking to investors, someone like me, how you look at it. Um, but I do have other ways for first time filmmakers, so I don't wanna <laughs> discourage people. Um, but that's how I look at projects. And then after that, I have conversations with the producers. I look at their past projects. Um, do they have experience managing a budget? Since I won't be on set. Like, can you, do you know how to manage the money I'm gonna give you? Uh, I need to understand that you know every single budget number, a line item that you put in. The one, like, just like Alicia said, business. Even if you don't have a line producer, even if it's your first project, you need to know why you have put every single line item in your budget, why you've made that amount, and when you're gonna spend it. You have to know the inside and out of every single number you put on the page because the less you know about that, the less it shows that you do not have a sense of how to manage the budget and money, and which does not encourage trust. Um, so anyway, so back to the investment. So then after that, conversations go along. I look at the budget. And I also look at the budget and I compare it to, as an investor, I have a lot of great relationships with a lot of distribution companies. I you know, always talk to them because it helps me get a sense of what's being, what are they, what's being sold, what they're looking at, and you know, budget levels that they're looking at. So for this past film I worked on, it was about 1.5, something like that. And it seemed like a reasonable budget for the project and also the risk potential was mitigated because of the level of the budget. Um, so then that's why I decided to sign on. Uh, so those, that's, as an investor, pure investor, that's what I look at. As a creative producer, um, beyond all those things, including all those things, I really also look at my relationship with the director. Um, I think I take so seriously the value of a director being able to be on set, feel safe, um, be able to uh, enact their vision in a world, in, in a safe environment that I as a producer want to create for them. I am not doing him any favors if I don't know the budget. I'm not doing any, any favors if I make crazy promises about investors that I will never be able to bring on. Um, and also even thinking about the future of the project. Uh, it's not just, it, once you, everything's in the can, that's where things really st get started. You have to think about marketing and PR. How can you help this director protect them in a way? Like, I, to be a creative is one of the bra bravest things ever. So that's something you really have to consider how much are you willing to put yourself up to protect your director? Um, I don't want to hog the answer, but, <laughs> but that's just, I, I can probably add more to it, but I want to allow other people to have a chance to speak. <laughs> that's great, thank you. Rachel, what would you say are the um, you know, necessary elements for a package um, that you're gonna put together to raise money for a film? Um, well, it sort of depends who I'm putting package together okay. for, right? I think so that I think for for the um, for this per for the purposes of this this discussion, I think we should think that it's probably you know an under five million dollar budget, um, probably you know not very you know sort of not what Hollywood would consider bankable stars. Right. Um, so. Well, uh, so for, from that I meant, um, am I doing it for a documentary or a narrative? Oh, sorry, for, for, for if, a narrative for the moment. Okay, so I, f for one is obviously the script, 
Right. And whether or not the uh, writer has other samples or they're a writer-director, I mostly work with writer-directors, to be perfectly honest. Um, just on, whether it's features, you know, documentaries, um, you know, there's, I'm a hybrid person and I tend to like people who are both creative and um, can actually have some production chops and know how to get things done. Um, so I look at the, the person who is presenting me with the material in the first place because, you know, I'm, I'm saying, am I going to marry you for anywhere from a couple of years to 10 years, or it could be, you know, I've had friends who've taken that long to make their features. And do they take criticism well? Because I want to know if I'm going to be an asset as a creative producer. I mean, I've given notes to huge directors. I used to be Peter Weir's assistant, and if he didn't have any problem taking my notes, um, probably you shouldn't either, but my notes could be wrong. And so what I want to know is, for me, before I even look at the package, I'm thinking about, can I have a relationship, a give and take, an honest relationship with that person. And because it's very much like you've given me your baby, and we're adopting it together, or I'm adopting your child, essentially. If it's that, or if it's an idea that I have and I'm looking for a writer, then that's another approach as well. But it has to be one, I'm a very honest person, so if you, we can't talk, but I, I'm honest for constructive criticism. And so I think you have, as a creative, I'm gonna flip it, as a creative person, you also have to have that trust in your producer, whomever that is, that they're paying attention to your project, that they're kind of in love with it, you know, that, you know, I mean, so f do, does it resonate with me is the first thing, right? Does that person, do I want to get that out in the world and I need to see this movie? So that's number one. The second is, okay, what's, you know, I, I can do my own budget because I was a line producer. So, you know, pretty much I can look and say, okay, how many days is this gonna take? You know, what, is this realistic? Do we have any relationships? Is it all in one country? You know, all those things. And I look at what I can bring as a resource. If it's something that I think, oh, I have a person who could play this, or I know the perfect you know, music producer who can add on another element. I'm really looking at what things are there already in the material that I can then leverage that would get somebody excited. So A, can it be made for a reasonable budget that would also, is the script something that can attract any kind of A-list, B-list, what kind of talent? You know, if it's not that, then Sometimes I look for getting a person like that in a smaller role um, because they've expressed some kind of interest in advocacy. I also happen to chair the uh, Producers Guild of America Diversity Committee and co um, was one of the co-founders of Women's Impact Network and then um, Ravenel Foundations. Uh, Cornelia Ravenel and I um, are co-founding Women's Independent Producers. So this is like an everyday conversation for me. It's not like, oh, I've decided it's one film. It's literally like, every day of my life there's a filmmaker or you know somebody who has something interest so from that plethora of people that I've been talking to over the last 20 30 years you figure out who you're gonna call right or if it's five months it doesn't really matter that's your wheelhouse and um, then I so it's this it's the script it's the finance it's who are the, um, the talent, and that by talent it's not just the actors, it's also do I have you know, an award-winning DP from another project that I've worked on who just says, oh yeah, I'll come support, right? So then I can attach them to the project. So it's all of those, if it's a heavily music-driven, can I get a music producer? Think about, I'll take Hidden Figures, right? We talked about Donna Gelati the other day. She got Pharrell to come on board um, through a meeting with his producer, and he had been writing all this music for, from that period and then felt like he could be an asset. So that's on a much larger scale than everything we would do, but it's that way within your own networks, right? You may have somebody you went to high school with that is now you know, performing somewhere and you know they're brilliant, but they have no break. I, put, I take all that stuff in a creative way and try to put it into a package that's appealing, that's also niche enough for something that I'm good at because I can't really sell what I'm not good at. Right, because I'm also saying I can deliver on this because of my track record working with these various artists, you know, that I can also bring to the table, either as investors or participants, all those things. 
So it's, I mean, you know, it, to nail down into it, obviously it's really drill down rather with more specific projects than I could give you better examples. But yeah, for me it's about a feeling and can I just sort of like, is it a puzzle that I want to get into and can put that out there. Um, in, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I, I love everything that's been said and I, I so agree with both of you. Um, I'm gonna give more nuts and boltsy um, as a cre I am a creative, like I'm an actress first, and um, and I had an idea. So I like had an idea, hired a writer on spec. Um, she got first money out is the way we did it, um, and like so our first investor in she got the she got the first the our first payday she got paid was how we did it. Um, I want to give you as much inform like specific information as possible. Um, and then uh, we hired a director um, and we started to get talent. Um, with equity, we, uh, we very purposely went in at a certain price, like we kept our budget at a certain level because we knew I don't think we can sell it for more than that. So even at a certain level, you get God willing, you get to a place where more people and bigger people want to invest. And you, we decided to say no because we wanted to be able, it was our first movie, and we wanted to be able to make a profit. I'm going to tell you something really, really, really important. Most filmmakers don't care about their investors. Not in a bad way not in a mean way, they just want to make their movie. And like, if it's your baby and you're the writer director, you don't really, you're like, yeah, yeah, I don't know if I'll make their money back, I don't care, I just want to make my movie. If you want to make movies for a long time, don't go there, my friends. Mm -hmm. Don't go there. Think about, at, like, I will not take someone's money unless I really think I can make it back. That's great advice. I will not make a movie, even if I love it, if I don't think it's gonna make money. That's just me, unless, I, unless I'm like, oh, I know someone who doesn't care if they get their money back. I'll, I'll talk to them about it. And I'll tell them, you probably are not gonna get your money back, it's like a doc, but it's in a really important piece of art. Wanna play? I'm super honest, um, that's how I roll. I, I have to be able to go to bed at night, and I won't make, I, like, if it's a movie about bird watchers, if I don't know any bird watchers, and I don't know. I don't know the audience or the investors. I don't go there. I, someone else will make that movie. So that's number one. In reference specifically about package, nuts and bolts here. I do two. Th I do. Th first of all, I find a lot of investors don't know how to read a script, especially if they're first-time investors and don't read scripts. So that's not helpful for me. Um, like that's not a good tool for. If I'm, I don't have UTA and I don't have fancy people involved, um, I'm not fancy enough. Um, so what I do is I create a deck, which is because most business people understand decks because they're used so much in business. It's like a little PowerPoint presentation that's 10 to 15 to 20 pages tops that basically tells what your movie's about, tells a little bit about the characters. It has to be so e it's like. You know what it is? It's a children's picture book for grown-ups. <laughs> I just realized that. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's, a it's a sexy children's picture book for grown-ups to explain what your movie's gonna be about. I'll send Perfect. you my, the one I'm working on right now. Um, and, uh, and then I do a business plan, and I have to show that I actually know shit about business and I'm gonna get shit done because I have to, sh you're giving me your money, I have to show that I know what to do with it. Like, it's those line items. It's my investors, especially on equity, I was dealing with women on Wall Street, they ask you every question on the planet. I mean, they are used, they are the smartest women you will meet. And we had to jump through so many hoops. Um, and so I have a business plan, I have my script, I have my, bu my line budget, um, I have my deck. We made a sizzle, 
on equity. I highly recommend a sizzle. We made it for free with, you know, just used things. And I went comedy, even though it's a drama. Um, but I, I showed, so it's a female-driven Wall Street movie. I used all these clips from other Wall Street movies. And it was like a clip from a Wall Street movie with a secretary. She's not a secretary. A clip from a Wall Street movie. She's not a hooker. A clip from a Wall Street movie. She's not a wife. A clip from a Wall Street movie. She's not the token woman in the background. Because that brought people in, and they're like, oh, I get it. I get what they're trying to do. Okay. Um, we made that for, like, free at NYU because our writer was an NYU professor. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is... We did very well with equity. We brought in, you know, our investors got a 115% return with less than a year. Um, on my next movie, I'm going a lower budget rather than I'm not going like, oh, I made that for this. I'm now I'm going to make a 10 million. I'm going under equity, um, and I'm going a very different world. I'm going a black comedy, which equity is not, but it's a black comedy that everyone who has read it it like resonates. It's you know, it's a step skipper um, and it but it does mean I might like I will talk to some of my investors on equity but I have to start fresh I don't I can't necessarily go to those women because they're Wall Street women and they won't necessarily be interested in a black comedy about motherhood um, and art um, so I have to like you can't always dip from the same pool um, so those are just a couple of like nuts and boltsy things that occur to me. That's, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, so Sam, can you talk a little bit about how you got the financing together for Southwest of Salem? Sure, yeah. Which is playing tonight at six. <laughs> um, so totally different setup. Um, I think that, you know, with documentary and especially with like such an urgent issue, when we started filming, the four protagonists were still in prison. Um, so there was like this urgent, like, we need your help to like go just literally get there and like, you know, talk to activists or, or go do an interview inside the prisons, go talk to their lawyers. Um, so a lot of the individual donors were not equity, it was donation based. You know, we had a fiscal sponsor, so um, they were tax deductible and it was folks that were already kind of in the social justice world or in queer funding spaces. Um, and that was a lot of like relationship building and uh, you know, getting people involved with the story and, and the activist side of it. Um, and then also in terms of, I think like 40% was grants. So um, we applied to everything. I mean, I think that there was a year where it was like a grant a week, like 52 grant applications. Um, so that was the main thing. And we did Kickstarter also early on. So that helped us raise about 15,000. What was the total budget? The total, but okay, so we, um, the director and I deferred our salaries for like six years. So we made it for, uh, I think it was like, ended up being under 200,000, not including those salaries. We were able to pay ourselves back because we didn't have equity, so when we were sold the film, I was able to cover some of those debts <laughs> that we were in. Um, but that's, that's sort of the model we had to, had to take, yeah. So when you applied, how did you decide which grants to apply to? Um, and how did you find the, the place? By the way, yeah. at the end, we're going to have a, a slide with some resources that everybody can look at um, with links that you can click through to see you know, various grants and foundation, grant opportunities and foundations and um, links like toolkit, like links for um, financing your film. So we'll have that up. So it was a mixture of, you know, documentary organizations, so like Chicken and Egg, Sundance, um, uh, Firelight Media, and then um, some more places like Australia, Lesbian Foundation for Justice, like places that do fund the arts but are more social justice oriented. Um, and just taking advantage of our networks, really like asking people and going to mentorship sessions and really going to every lab we could and um, participating in Independent Film Week was huge. Um, so just having like a week of just meetings with people and gathering as much information since it's our first time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think some of the resources online just kind of looking at lists of all of the grant applications and applying to them. Um, 
but not applying to ones that were, you know, weighing if something was going to take a week long of, of writing and it wasn't really, a, you know, a good fit, kind of weighing the percentage of, of how likely it was. Even though it's, I mean, nothing's really a shoe in with grant applications, but just kind of seeing, you know, what their track record was. Um, let's talk a little bit about crowdfunding and so Sam, let's start with you in uh, Kickstarter. What was your experience like? And it sounds like it was pretty successful. Yeah, I've, I've done a couple Kickstarters before on short films, um, and this was the first feature one. Um, it was a lot of work. <laughs> I would say it's, I feel like a lot of people don't realize you need one person to kind of manage it the entire time. So it's really hard to do when you're in production or if you're both on set or, you know. Um, but yeah, it was great to build a base around the film and really reach out to folks. And a lot of those people stayed with us for the whole process. I mean, it was six years um, and we're really invested in the outcome. So I think, I mean, it was a great experience for me. I, I know my director is like, never again. I will never crowdfund again. Um, <laughs> but I think it can be really useful, so. Tiana, do you wanna? Yeah, actually, I think crowdfunding, you know, I think it's probably one of the best tools for first time filmmakers. Um, it's really hard. It's not fun to constantly be on social media, plugging this thing. Um, but it's almost like you, the way you pay your own dues. Like, for instance, you have your first film. You know, it's a great script, you believe in it. You may not have a, as much of a sense of the business side of the world, but you know, you have this great creative vision. And you deserve to have the freedom to put that out into the world. Um, the easiest way to do that without people putting pressure on you, because when you do have investors, when you do have other people's money, and at least I really appreciate what you said, because most filmmakers, the moment you take someone's check, they are a part of your story. You have to care about them. And if you don't, like the repercussions, even if you get your film made, they're not worth it. Like this is an industry, it's a small town, like you wanna just perpetuate healthy relationships with everyone. So as a first time filmmaker, you know, you may not be able to get big stars on it, but I would say crowdfunding is the best way to assemble resources to help support you in, your, in creating your vision um, that don't really come with like this albatross around your neck in terms of having to give this money back or make this money back. Um, you know, there's another platform, what's a seed and spark, which I really like you know, that you can actually, people can donate actual goods to your production, which I think is another amazing way to build camaraderie and support behind your project. So as a first time filmmaker, crowdfunding, what that does, it builds a support network around you as you're trying to build your first project. Um, and then it gives, you, it gives you an avenue to receive the resources. So let's say you had this great film and you are able to get into a festival. And that opens up doors for you because then you're able to begin to speak with other people that have been in the industry for a longer period of time. You're able to maybe even get a rep representation so that way you can get your script to places like UTA, CAA, and they can start advocating on your behalf and then make it to perhaps my desk and that could be your next film. Um, you know, but really, you know, and also like, I think Alicia, once again, like with the budget, like think about your budget. Like if it's your first project, start small. If you have a script that's probably gonna cost about a million dollars to make, save it. <laughs> that should not be your first project. Really, start small. Like we, there's, there's a, it's a beautiful process with filmmaking. Don't rush it. Allow yourself to build time. You know, make the mistakes that everyone should make to learn on your first project. And I think crowdfunding is probably the best tool for that, for first time filmmakers to do so. I'm just gonna add one other little thing. Oh, did you wanna say something? Okay, um, my director on Equity made her first movie when she was at USC for $81,000 on, um, on, I think, Kickstarter. It went to Tribeca Film Festival, won the Nora Ephron Prize there, and that's how I found her. Wow. Um, you know, so crowd, and it also, as, as you just said, it, it, it creates your audience, which is huge in the beginning. It creates a network of people who want to see the movie and who will bring their friends to the movie. Because that's the other thing 
from the beginning, you want to think about your audience. You want to, you're, as you're telling these stories, think you want to, you're basically reverse engineering. When you're a producer, not just a creative, you're reverse engineering. You have to think about your audience before you even put pen to paper in a way. Who's your audience and what do you want to say to them and, and how are you going to get them into the theater? And the other piece that I really believe in is sponsorship and brands. So I'm out of the box of all of these people this way. I don't think anyone else thinks this way. It's kind of one of my like, it's my personal secret sauce that I'm sharing with you all, but you can't tell anyone. <laughs> um, but I, and I tell this to first time filmmakers all the time, like if, like think about a little web series with a local restaurant in your town, in your neighborhood, and and talk to them about it. Like, hey, wanna give me five thousand dollars and I'll do a little web series in your restaurant, and it'll be an advertisement for your restaurant. <laughs> it's free advertising for them. It's free PR for them. You there might be cool platforms. Um, and you're getting a free location, <laughs> right? This is how I think as a producer. As I, gr as I look at a project, I won't say yes to it unless I can think about those connections. I have to like be able to connect the dots. There are a lot of amazing scripts I read that I'm like, I, I can even love the character and be like, oh my God, I wanna play this woman, but I don't, I don't know how to produce that one. Um, so, Crowdfunding is amazing, and the other thing that I will say, even though I, I've never crowdsourced my own movie, is I will um, make a menu similar to what they do on crowdfunding for my investors. So I've created menus that have similar, like the perk situation for the people who invest. So, you know, on equity, we, had cute titles like you know that were in the finance world like a VP you know head of global markets you know depending on your level of investment and depending on how much you invested you would have different perks you would be able to meet a famous cast member you would be able to take a visit on set you would be able to come visit the edit room based like on, you would have a walk on you would have online um, you'd be surprised how many people would pay money to have a line in a movie. Um, and in fact, on the movie that I did between my short and equity that I helped bring some money in on this other movie simply because there was a very wealthy friend of a friend who wanted his daughter to intern. And he was willing to invest in this movie so that this young woman could learn about filmmaking. Um, and you'd be surprised how much you can sort of provide value. And that's another huge thing that you want to think about as a, as a producer. How am I providing value? Um, I'll also, like the last thing I'll say about this is when I talk to my investors, I say, I even though I made my last people back 115%, I cannot promise you a thing. I'm gonna, I promise I will do my best, but all I can promise you is a great experience. I promise to include you in a super fun life experience. You will have a piece of art for the rest of your life that you can say I helped make, and it, I only tell stories that like make the world a better place, so you can promise, I can promise that. Um, and start conversations, and it's like, in, I always say, it's like investing in a piece of art on the wall. Like, yeah, it might increase in value, but it might not, and you will love looking at it every day. Um, but I can't promise anything else. I promise to try. Um, I wanted to say something about crowdfunding. Um, so I, I have had only one real experience crowdfunding for a film that, um, and I've helped a number of other people since then. Um, and my advice, particularly about crowdfunding, is don't make too many perks that you're gonna have to be fulfilling. It's really exhausting. And quite frankly, no one is really investing for that reason anyway. It's just like, oh, that's another bonus. Um, but 
you know, I'll, I'll give an example. We, we crowdfunded for a documentary that has, in some ways, the more resources you think you have, the worse off you are because then you make more promises. So we promised a DVD of um, the filmmaker's previous film. Now, unfortunately, in that time, the film, they, she changed distributors, and so that film was not actually even available, except for us to reproduce. Now it's on Blu-ray, and, and so we will be doing it. But that's, that took like a year, which wasn't, you know, we could, wouldn't have known that, and we didn't want to send anybody like, essentially our own bootleg DVD, right, <laughs> of, of this great film. Um, and then the publisher, we promised these books, now I, we're finally getting them, but that was out of print for a while. And so there were all these obstacles that, while it seemed like, oh, they were good ideas, I mean, um, they were, and we did get certain things donated, and it, all those things that were like, oh, now I'm in a fulfillment mode. You know, literally, I have, like, I don't know anything about that. I don't do manufacturing and packaging yeah. supply. Unless like, you make Ginsu knives. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. If Something. you happen to make Ginsu knives already. Yeah. <laughs> but it's really, it's thinking about, you know, what can you give that is easier? Sometimes it's through somebody else. You know, one of the best things, actually, we gave was uh, Terry Lawler donated uh, you know, NYWIF from NYWIF tickets to Muse Awards. Now, I didn't have to do anything for that. That was great for NYWIF. It was part of our same theme of our cause and women's empowerment. And so that was a great... We had an artist do... So, but there were certain things that I thought, why did we do that? You know, and so what the heck? Don't all... Another no-no is don't give a credit that's like a producer credit for somebody or an AP credit for someone who's giving money into your film. Well, if they give a lot of money, they can be an executive producer, great. But those other credits will only piss off other potential producers, I will tell you, because it's not a real credit, right? For donating money, you're not an associate producer unless you're actually working on the film. So one thing I think first time filmmakers do is they give a lot of credits away. Really take your time and look at what that means. Also think about who do you want to, figure out your responses. You know, they tell you that you can go to any crowdfunding, thing, but they'll t like literally generate all the ideas, responses, your schedule, because otherwise it just seems so overwhelming. But if you, you know, kind of have a, a, a list of standard replies, like tweeting, you know, if you're doing an event, they send you like, oh, these are 10 tweets suggested, it helps. It helps your team. I mean, there's certain things you just, because it is one of those like constant barrage, and then you feel like, oh, somebody pinged me and I'm happy, like they love my film, whatever. Like it becomes this sort of obsessive thing. So the more, because um, really that's not the project, right? That's, you're trying to make the film. And that can take up too much of your time as a job into itself, unless you happen to have enough money that you can hire somebody to do that, right? That's but great. most people are not. In that I just want to make sure we get Sam because she had a. That was mostly what I was. Gonna <laughs> say. But um, but yeah, in terms of DVDs, I mean, we had this issue with Southwest of Salem because we promised DVDs and then had to like remember that when we were negotiating our contract, and so we did like weave it in to like have the amount we needed. But I feel like so many people just over promise. You end up like losing money on a, on a Kickstarter sometimes. Um, and also, if you're doing something for. Um, a higher amount. There's places like Film Presence or groups that you can hire that will like do a crowdfunding campaign for you um, for a fee, and that can be useful for some projects too. Yeah, no, I was just going to say. I mean, before you undertake a crowdfunding campaign, it's it's you know anyone can go on to Kickstarter or you know the any of the Indiegogo and just type out a couple of words. Create a whole plan of attack. Not only, like, it should have a schedule of also when you're going to supply chain. Supply, I also run marketing and PR at an energy company, like supply chain. People need to understand how to get things from A to B. DVDs, books, like, you have to consider all that in your plan of attack. Everything, and the narrative has to make sense. And that goes back into marketing and PR as well, which was brought up earlier. Um, you know, even the sizzle reel. Like, I give money to short film projects sometimes just because I'm so impressed by the amount of work that went into just this, their uh, crowdfunding campaign. I'm like, my God, like, they, here, here's $50. Like, good luck to you, like, because I just want to see them succeed. Um, and, you know, that is the first step 
to your audience seeing what you could potentially do. So before you even sign on, look at, write out everything, write out your narrative, like in terms of what you want to put onto the crowdfunding site. What do you want the sizzle world to be? Make a schedule, not just like from the timeline of when you're actually raising the money to even post, like okay, we're gonna deliver these things to like so, so, and so level here, then. Always been able to figure that out because you will run into all these things, but if you have a solid plan of attack, the process will seem, it'll still be a lot of work, but it'll be much more fluid. That's great, great, great advice. Thank you. Um, can we put up this slide that has uh, the list of resources? If uh, You might wanna just take a quick snapshot of it, plus um, a the, the film festival is gonna add it to the website um, as additional resources. Um, and, uh, but, you know, these are some, some great, uh, funding sources. The POV1 lists, you know, kind of a, almost all of the major documentary, um, grant opportunities and, uh, and then this, uh, resources for statistics, uh, Ms. Factor Toolkit has some really interesting stats that you can use in your business plan. Uh, some, some great. Uh, and this business trends for tax laws, we, we didn't really get to talk about tax incentives. That could be a whole other panel, and it has been at the <laughs> Produced By Conference, right? Uh, but I want to take this opportunity to open it up to questions. I'm sure you guys have some questions. So, uh, yes, right there. Thank you, of creating our movie and making a nonprofit company as like an umbrella. And I know that there's perks to having a nonprofit because when people give, then they can get tax write offs. I was wondering if you have any opinions on that. Uh, I, I, um, I would say that's, that's an interesting idea. Make sure you have a good lawyer because um, it, it, you can run into some trouble because if, if the nonprofit entity if, if I would assume it's separate from the entity that you're creating for the actual film production company, be careful because the way you can run into some serious like financial difficulties with IRS or whatever. So um, I think having a nonprofit entity could be a good um, enticement for people, perhaps offer it as a tax deduction, but then figure out, but I don't know how the resources would then funnel into your for profit, well, like the into the entity that's being used to to um, produce the film, so that's that's well, they essentially would be your fiscal sponsor, right? Yeah. The nonprofit, yeah. like instead of going to Women Make Movies or some other, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think if it, I don't know enough about the project, but I would say if it's a project that you think the nonprofit itself has a sustainable life and a need for it because of its own advocacy. But yeah, the reporting for nonprofits is extensive yeah. and you may not want to get into that. If it's yeah. something you're good at, some people who do foundation work and that's easy a for them. Degree. Yeah, a law degree or, yeah, but there's, it's definitely. But, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the reason women make movies and Fractured Atlas and yeah. these places are these nonprofits for you to use for a fee is because it's really hard to manage. Yeah. Um, and I did look into it, and it it's not, it is, it's a lot of time, yeah. similar to a crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. It is a full-time job. But the, the other thing that I, I've done with some of our films is we have an academic fiscal sponsor. So it would be because I'm creating an archives um, as part of what we're doing for the film, then um, they actually do it and don't have a fee. So they're able, and through their own university funds that we've been able to get individual, you know, grantors or so, you know, even in crowdfunding, some people donated through our university sponsor rather than through Women Make Movies because they wanted not to have that money go yeah. to the various crowdfunding sources. And so we got our larger donations that way. So then so. through the fiscal sponsorship, the person still gets a write-off, thank you. Um, yes. The person still gets a write-off, but it's not through your movie, it's through whatever, through your fiscal sponsor. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. I'm actually, I'm with Filmmakers Collaborative out of Boston. A, a really good one, yes. actually. Thanks. Maria Aggie Carter hi. always tweets I'm, that horn. I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm, oh hi. I'm Jen Myronic, and I'm, I work for Filmmakers Collaborative, and we've been a 30-year-old fiscal, fiscal sponsor of films. We've received over $45 million 
in grants. We do grants management, exactly. It is difficult. We have set up several projects where part of your budget that you want to raise funds for can be through fiscal sponsor, but there has to be a absolute firewall between that and equity. Yep. But the one thing is that you can get funds for development and research of your film, and you can get, um, there's several different aspects, and you can also decide what line items are going to be fiscally sponsored. I think it's a really great idea for documentaries. It's a little tougher for, I think, feature equity films that are more narrative natured. Um, but actually, what I wanted to bring up, um, so I'm also, a, besides working for, um, I also have a film that's coming out called Humanity Needs Dreamers. It's a theater um, time travel to meet Marie Curie in her lab. And I'm actually finishing a narrative script to continue that story as a feature film later. Because um, we don't know how to tell the stories of women in science, as we've seen with Hidden Figures, we should have had Katherine Johnson's story since the 60s. It should have been Katherine and John. And the reason he died recently is because of her. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made it. So, you know, how do we make sure that our narratives are there? So with film financing, the question is, I found that just like women who want to make startups are having difficult times, how for women going into this space? We're now proving models, but how do we convince um, funders that, you know what, the market is there, people, of everyone wants these stories, and how do we make sure that science stories make it into the cultural um, Zeitgeist. I, it's funny, I, I could speak to this for, so I also run marketing and PR at an energy company. It's actually run by my sister. It, we just raised the largest Series A ever raised by a black female founder. And it's, yeah. And it's funny, raising money for films and raising money for that, I'm like, it's still the same bullshit. Like, these people, <laughs> like, these people don't get it. Like, we don't have an app. We're not some dude from Silicon Valley or just some dude, you know, is making some dumb app. Like, we're trying to make an energy company. People are like, um, can you just do a little bit more due diligence? I'm like, ugh. So, <laughs> so uh, on the science level, I hear you. On the film level, I hear you. Um, you know, I wish, I, I do not have an easy prescription for that. One, I am with you on that on so many levels. The only way I could say it right now is that, you know, we all, honestly, it starts with us supporting each other. Really, we got it like, when I, so I, um, a group of girlfriends and I, we went to go and see Hidden Figures, and there were groups across the country that were doing that. It has now made more money than La La Land. It is now the highest grossing Oscar-nominated film this year. And that's because of us. We went and do, did that, and I think eventually, you know, the, the, the tide is turning. Like, my sister was able to raise around, you know, for films as well for me. Like, my last film was starring, like, you know, a middle-aged, like, um, woman. But I was able to convince the investors I work with, no, that this is going to work with here, here, and here. And there are going to be some people who will not want to look at the numbers. And, like, fine. I don't need your money. I'd rather work with people who want to ride this upward wave with me. So, but it really starts with us really supporting each other. Um, you know, that's, that's the, that is the first starting point, and then eventually, and also bringing along other supporters who are not necessarily women, but also want to continue on that trajectory. But I thank you so much for that question. I think it's... Well, one of the things I was going to say is, like, the Ms. Factor Toolkit is something that's going to be updated, but it actually has statistics and resources, numbers, and that's part of it is to say, you, want to, you have to make the economic case, because the fact of the matter is they're investing, it's venture capitalism, yeah. right? You know, some people are grantors and they just want to get on board because, for the experience or because they're committed to your mission or the subject or something is dear to their heart. Um, those are wonderful. Um, angels, really. Um, but I think one of the things, it's, it is your responsibility to say, hey, look, cases like Hidden Figures or any other number of, you know, women-driven um, films, television shows, you know, talk about the buying power. Look at your film from a really marketing uh, perspective and get those stats because they exist. Some of them are on that uh, website, but that website will lead you to other resources that, you know, and read the trades. There's like good news sometimes, not always, but you know, so the myth gets perpetuated that doesn't have anything to do with the facts. You know, we're all familiar with alternative facts and a lot of times that's what the person who possesses in their head that's sitting across from you based upon something else, because they're not, they don't have to do the research, the things are coming to them. So you're saying, here's the heavy lifting you don't have time to do, but in fact you're leaving money on the table because of X, Y, and Z. 
And the only two, like two tiny things, I'm sure you know about Sloan Foundation, yeah? Right, they've, they've funded a project that'll be read tomorrow, which Melissa says is really good. The Great. Big tend, yeah. That, I know, I know that yeah. they're picky. Um, they're, very picky yeah. they're very picky, but like, keep on, keep at them. Um, and uh, one thing that I will say is I was very dedicated to hiring women on equity, and I'm very dedicated to doing that on my next film. And that's another thing to be able to say is to women and men, you're making change by helping, by making this movie. When you make this movie, I am dedicated to having a female writer, having a female director, having a female editor, having like having half of our crew, having half of our extras be women. Like you are helping change the world by investing in this movie. Um, and that's a really good thing to be able to say. Mm -hmm. um, yes, right here. So I don't have a microphone, but my question is about pre-selling. Oh, well, now I do. Yeah. So it used to be uh, you would pre-sell your foreign markets as a way to uh, finance your film. Now with uh, streaming services for new, new filmmakers, is that a possibility in a market? And uh, I've been trying to research like what the different streaming services are paying for independent film. Can you give me a kind of range? Or, you know, just a starting point to, uh, there's no range. Well, just yeah, throw I, out I some mean, numbers read, for I would specific. say read, read The Hollywood Reporter from, uh, from the, read all the reports about Sundance this year because everything broke this year. Mm -hmm. So like, sh everything changed. Yeah. So just read about it and it's not. It IndieWire has a list of all the deals out of Sundance. Uh, with numbers and uh, and who who the buyers were, so you can see what Amazon bought, you can see what Netflix, Netflix bought, you can see, um, you know, A24, and it, it's a complete list, and they update it constantly. And has any of the streaming services actually, again, like the foreign markets, invested in a film before it's been made with a new a new filmmaker or a new no, screenwriter? Not, no, not with a new filmmaker that not, I know of. Not yet. I, well, okay. Not well, they yet, commission but, films, yeah. of course, right? But then, yeah. but that filmmaker would have to have. I mean, it most likely would have to have a track record before they were to commission the film. I mean, even Sean Hader, who made Tallulah, that Netflix ended up buying, was a, an Orange Is the New Black writer. Yeah. They didn't fund that. Yeah. They bought it once it was made. Right. Also, even this thing with the pre-selling, like, I mean, it depends on your budget level. But I mean, I've had deals come across my desk where, like. You know, they pre-sold some of the rights, and like the the payback wasn't. It just didn't make sense economically. So you know, your property, the value of it can increase exponentially once the film's made. So you know, I would hold on to as much power as you have to make the best deal at the end. I think we have time for two more questions right here. Hi, can you um? Thank you. Can you go back to this idea of marketing and of cultivating your audience base? before you reach out to investors. I think it's really smart and I think it's really important. But for instance, I'm a, uh, I'm a Barnard alum, I'm a Juilliard playwright. I have a script that was a finalist for Sundance Screenwriters Lab, but it doesn't have a niche market. So for instance, like with equity, you know, I know you really reached out to women on Wall Street. With your Marie Curie film, I'm imagining you reached out to the science community and women in science. I don't have that. H how do you take a nar like a like a narrative. I mean, I have some really interesting actors attached, but how do you take what to me as a creator feels like a it's a love story and find who that target audience is going to be in order to start that kind of fundraising narrative? It's a love story, right? Yeah. Why did you write it? Why did you feel? I mean, for me, it becomes personal. All of these things, why people, branding, marketing, it's all ultimately tapping into what people feel personally, right? Yeah. There's something that's missing there. So whether, you know, love is forever interesting to people. So I think it's, you know, I, I have no idea what your story is about, right? But I think that, you know, there could be a whole campaign around love versus hate, what understanding, I mean, there can be so many things that you're thinking about around that theme. I mean, it's Valentine's Day, all you gotta do is look on, yeah. there's probably a million memes around that theme, right? Because people are lonely, you know, is it somebody in a city? You know, I mean, what's the whole, is it about being kind of isolated in love? I mean, there's lots of niche groups in any arena, you know? 
I think that's smart. And yes, but apropos of that, then do you like reach out to lone, like is your marketing campaign then for all the lonely people who've been jilted? I mean, jilted, I don't know. It could be like, dating sites. Right. I have no idea okay. based on your script. You know, oh, it could be something to do with like where do people go look for love? You know, is it, you know, something that you're marketing to dating sites or I don't know, like conventions around this sort of thing? I, I'm, sure, I'm sure they exist. I don't know them personally, but I think you have to delve into that world of who is your your audience in general. Is it someone like you? Why is it? I mean, I, I think from, I do a little bit of introspection and then I would ask friends in mm -hmm. a, kind of a, a group, you know, just read it oh, and think about yeah. what this... Common themes. Yeah. Common th yeah like, that's yeah. a great idea, Brooke. Uh -huh. um, if you want to have a reading of it and then we'll do a like brainstorms, yeah. we can do that. Yeah. What advice do you have for nonprofits that are uh, hoping to produce a, produce a film? So for example, my organization um, hosted, or I'm sorry, um, it created the Say Her Name campaign. Um, and we've been trying to produce a documentary or a film for a while, but it's been difficult um, reaching out to foundations and, and, and hearing back even about what that would look like. So is there a different process for nonprofits um, trying to get funding? So you, are a non you work for a nonprofit mm -hmm. that is trying to produce a film. Mm -hmm. And how long has your nonprofit been around? 20 years. Yeah, you guys have traction. <laughs> you, guys, like, you guys definitely have traction. I would recommend even trying to reach out to, um, well, there's, there's some different ways to go about it. Like if there's a film you like, you could try and reach out directly to that director's representative or the writer's representative. Um, I think there could be an interesting partnership with an agency where they could even help defray some of the cost of the production or funds with their investment. Um, Backers and perhaps put partner one of the, put one of their artists onto the project, but um, yeah, it's, I would say try and reach out to other organizations, not just other nonprofits, but particularly like agencies where they could if unless you have a specific talent in mind that you'd want, want to work with. But twenty years, I mean, if you have traction, yeah, you could definitely reach out to like one of the big players. Yeah, I mean, certainly branding and marketing companies, a lot of people are interested in doing this sort of stuff. The other thing that um, I happen to be on the board of Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and some nonprofits just come in and they do their training there. It's free. And, you know, you just have to go through the programs. They also broadcast those short films, and they're looking for that content. But, um, but you know, if... If, I don't know if there's a filmmaker in your group. Do you already have somebody who... All right, so you're also looking for somebody who wants to make your film. So that's the heaviest lifting, right? I would approach it that way to find somebody you can collaborate with because you don't, you're not going to be able to put forward that creative vision and write the pitch of what it is unless you already know it, um, and that's even better. But I think it's finding somebody to collaborate with on that level, and then there are other... You know, we can talk afterward about... Um, things that are resources that are available that are actually free in the city and what each borough. I'll just add um, to that. Sometimes the uh, grants are targeted towards filmmakers. So if you partner with a filmmaker, that filmmaker can be the you know sort sort of face forward to to other foundations. A and there are some grants that are only for organizations mm -hmm. too. So yeah. you have to kind of sift through that. Some people don't give individual grants. Um, I see Working on it, actually, but yes, I, 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 I have, uh, that's on my list of continuing um, discussions. Um, I'll take one last question. Yes, in the, in the uh, red. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Rashmi, and um, this has been very informative. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm one of the screenwriters in the Iris Lab for a, the Athena Film Festival, and it's just been a really incredible experience. My question uh, about independent film specifically, I was wondering if any of you have worked with um, 
different, like there's so many films coming out with joint productions globally, and I, I, my heritage is Indian, and I'm seeing that a lot. I was just in India, and I saw a movie about a gold medalist female wrestler that was produced by Disney. I mean, Disney came up, and I kind of had this, like, where am I? And I'm like, oh, I'm in a theater in Bombay. So I was just wondering if there are, like, do you feel like that's something that happens later in if you're an independent filmmaker and you're making your first second feature or is it possible on this one of these you know earlier filmmaking um ventures or like where do you see that because i feel like i'm seeing it everywhere i see reliance which is an indian phone company producing a lot of stuff here and then i when i'm in india and i'm watching movies um i just see like you know different uh, companies that come up and i'm just curious if if this is something that you guys have experience with or have worked with on your own, because um, the script I've written does have sort of a global, um, so I'm just, you know, that's kind of where I feel like I would head and I was wondering what you have to say or what you think. Are you talking about specifically about international co-productions or yes, grant Yes, international co-productions. So since we don't actually have official co-production agreements in the U.S., you know, I think, but the fact that you, are you, um, do you carry a passport from India? No, I mean, I'm a but, citizen. I have oh, a Indian visa. Okay. So, um, and you probably have people that you could partner with there, right, in India. I mean, we have some people in the audience who have more specific experience producing in India. Cornelia, <laughs> um, that probably know a lot more than I do, and um, I've not produced there specifically, but I think I do a lot of stuff overseas uh, in the Caribbean. And there I just, honestly, I just get the people to participate for their own reasons. You know, they invest in, you know, whether it's in kind or actual money um, for, you know, smaller projects. I, you know, I don't, I should let someone else take this because I think it's um, there are a lot of foundation investments too that are specific to certain regions. What's the one about the Sud? That's I think maybe very specifically for that region, including India. So I think there are, you have to look even within the money that's available. There is, there are some that are specific to those regions, um, and of course your money goes a lot long, farther shooting in India than it would here. Sorry, I, I thought I had something more interesting to say on this subject. <laughs> I, mean, I think, oh, well, oh, Cornelia, yes. Just, just briefly, yeah. um, most countries have film institutes. We don't. We don't yeah. make a lot of money in the arts in general. Mm -hmm. But what you need to do to access that money, and it's federal money, it's regional money, it's local money in most many of these countries, is you need a local partner, yeah. a local community partner. And once you have that community partner, but it sometimes has to be a majority partner, then you can start to access those funds. Right. Often you'll have to do, uh, you know, take some portion of the production uh, or cast from that territory. You might have to edit if it's, uh, you know, for instance, in Scandinavia or, or Germany, you might have to do your editing. So that would mean, you know, taking your entire, you know, edit process to, to a different country. So, you know, there are, you know, it's, it, it can be complicated and expensive, so you just have to keep that in mind. Um, with that, oh, um, I, I don't know if we have, I think we have to run. Uh, thank you all so much, you've been a fantastic audience. Thank you to the Ravenal uh, Foundation and for Athena for sponsoring, and thank you to our amazing panelists today for participating. Yeah, it was so great to meet you.